chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 12 through 17. And the title of the sermon this morning is The Church Who Compromised. Starting in verse 12 of chapter Revelation chapter 2, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. And even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth, where I have a few things, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou them also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving. He that receiveth it. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask this morning that though it may be gloomy outside, that our spirits are not gloomy inside. Lord, we pray that you again this morning lift the, the beggar out of the dunghill. Lord, we pray that even this morning again that you feed us from your word. Hide me behind the cross. Give me fluency of speech, Lord. Give us the applicability from your word. Teach us this morning. Instruct us in your word. May we find the, this portion of the text that may apply to us in your dealings with the church of Pergamos. May we also see this morning, Lord, as we begin to look into a church that is dealt with more harshly by you in the New Testament, that though we cry this morning and cry out and ask that your presence will be with us, that we cry out and ask that your spirit be poured out upon us, Lord, that we may leave here this morning that understanding that not only does your presence bring us joy, not only does your presence bring us happiness, Lord, but your presence is a purifying presence. Lord, we pray that we search our hearts, Lord. We cry like the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and see if there be some wicked way in me. Lord, we know that you are a God who delights in mercy. Show us our wicked ways that we may repent of it and follow wholeheartedly after you. We give thanks to you for all in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a man who was on his way to catch a train. He had this important meeting at work, and he knew that the train left at 8.05. This meeting was so important to him that the entire night before, he barely slept because the fear was that the train, or that the, pow the storm that was happening the night before would knock his power out. As he finally got dressed in his suit and tie, he opened the front door to his surprise to see his son sitting at the base of the bottom steps playing in the mud. He was rubbing mud all over his face, rubbing mud all over his arms. The father shook his head because he had every intent to make it to the train at 8.05. So he leaped from the bottom of the steps over his son, and within one step he found himself laying next to his son in the mud. 
The father is now in the mud. The son is now in the mud. And the father is feeling extremely frustrated as his son is completely delighted with playing in the mud. But the father knows he has somewhere to go. And this somewhere he has to go was not part of the dressing, uh, the, the dress to be covered in mud. The father had one thing in mind and that he was trying to catch this train. So he jumped to his feet out of the mud. As best as he could, he cleaned the mud off of himself and began to run to the train. Because he knew the 805 train had a restroom in, it in which he could get the dirt off of him that he had accumulated on him while being in the mud. There are two types of people that we're going to find in the church of Pergamos. There are two types of people we'll find in any church today. There are the people who are satisfied with being in the mud and the people who have found themselves on occasion slipping in the mud but are recognizing that the mud is not the place in which they have any desire to stay. Their mind is focused on the 805 train that they have somewhere to go. There are people in this church in Pergamos who have slipped up. You know what? There are people in our church this evening who have slipped up. This morning have slipped up. You know why? Because this kind of stuff happens. We all make mistakes. But instead of sitting in the mud, we have to keep our minds focused that we need to catch the 805 train. These people here in Pergamos have decided to stay in the mud because why? Because they have compromised. This was not intentional how maybe you could say that they ended up there, but regardless, they had found themselves in this mess. You got to understand that as we serve God, if we keep our eyes on him, we'll always be focused that we're on our way to catch a ticket out of here. If we keep our eyes on God, we'll completely understand that there is no satisfaction of being covered in mud. I use that loosely to reference sin. Our minds will always be focused that we have a desire to have a different lifestyle than we once had. That we want to have the experiences that God wants us to have. We want to live the life that God wants us to live. And even for even some of us here this morning, maybe we do not know God. Well, this is the exciting thing about God, is that in this time in the mud, while we were dead in our trespasses in sin, God has provided a way for us. See, the man was looking for the 805 train. The 805 train for us in humanity, it still contains a washing, and the washing is the blood of Jesus Christ. And those who wash in this sink will be cleansed. The music that would say you could play in that room would be that grace that is greater than all our sin. Pergamus had compromised. The reminder to them is that though you have compromised, though you have found yourself back in sin, though you have found yourself in the mud, it is time to get up and get back to the washing and be reminded that God has something for you to do. They had allowed sin to go unchecked. They had allowed sin to set up shop. And the worst part of all of this sin that was setting up shop is that the sin that was setting up shop in the church of Pergamos wasn't a secret sin. It wasn't like Achan, so to say, secret sins in a sacred camp. Those Achan's secret sins did affect the entire camp of Israel. It was privately known to him. But what we see here in Pergamos is their sin that they had there was widely known. It was completely understood. It was false doctrines, and yet it was being taught within the house of God, convincing others like the doctrine of Balaam, convincing others that it's okay to live like the Nicolaitans did. As we are reminded here when you come to the end of this text that the Lord is calling for all to repent, for all to return, for all to follow after him. And by the way, even in the midst of this sin, even in the midst of Pergamus' great failure, God reminds them, the Lord reminds them, if you will just repent and get on, reward, get on board, it is not too late 
to have your reward. What I find interesting on the outskirt of this, but I also find comforting, is that, I don't know if you're this way, but in the technical field, one thing that always irritates me is that as they continuously come out with different valves and different equipment, nothing works the same. Everything's different. It is so frustrating. So you're continuously having to get a new manual and keep all the manuals with you but you, because you cannot memorize all of the different ways each valve functions. It's so much inconsistency. One thing, just even on the outside view of this text in the letter to the church of Pergamos, I am so thankful that though this word of God has been written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years, it screams consistency. God did not accept this behavior three, 4,000 years prior to writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. That's why he can reference Balaam. This is why he can reference Balak. This is why he can reference the Nicolaitans. Because God's word has stayed the same. It has stood the test of time. And why it brings trouble to us is because we live in such an inconsistent age. Yet, it brings great encouragement because God's word is still Consistent. God's desire for his children has always been clear. Remember what he told them in Deuteronomy, to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy strength. His desire was never, never for them to compromise. And still, even to this day, when we get here to Revelation chapter 2 and read about Pergamos, and even to our current day today, Sin still repulses God. He still has no joy in it. He still will not dwell in it. And one thing that's troubling here with Pergamos is that we're going to see people who were willing to die for their faith and did die for their faith. We're going to see people who laid it all on the line for the name of the Lord. And yet, in the midst of these people who would not bow, who would not bend, who would not break, who would not back away from the name of the Lord, while these people existed in the church of Pergamos, yet there was other people who were teaching this doctrine of Balaam, who was teaching this, these words of Balaam, who was teaching the words of the Nicolaitans. And the thing that is interesting is that though there were people who were being persecuted and put to death in Pergamos, God brought judgment down upon the entire church because they did not follow his steps in purging the church. See, sin cannot remain unpunished in the church. Matter of fact, the Lord tells them when we come to the end of this that if you guys don't do something, if you guys don't repent and act quickly, I will come unto you with the sword of my mouth and handle it myself. He said, I will judge them. God does not view sin lightly. Why? Why? Why is this such an important thing to understand here? Because if God throughout history ever allowed and viewed sin as acceptable, it would compromise his character. It would compromise who he is. God, I mean, think about it in this. You see these people who died for their faith. I mean, we even see reference here, Antipas. You look at him and you say, wow, look at this. And while we would step back and kind of tip our hat to the people at Pergamos because we say, wow, they're willing to die for their faith. And we even question in our own hearts whether we are or not. But these people were willing to. But yet, even though there were these believers who were willing to give so much of their own to God. The Lord will not stop the judgment of sin just because of a faithful few. He will never stop the judgment of sin to make a Christian feel better. His message is still not changed. Not 2,000 years after Balaam, and not 4,000 years later. It still has not changed. Listen, Micah says it. He retaineth not his anger, and he still delights in mercy. How do we even know such a thing? 
Because yet even though he hates sin, people say, well, God is not a God of hate. Our Lord is not a, a, a Lord of hate. He doesn't hate. He is a God of love. Yet here he says, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He even told the church at Ephesus that he was proud of them because they withstood the teachings of the Nicolaitans. That thing which I hate. God hates it. And yet, even though he hates it, the extension to the church of Pergamos was mercy. Repent. You've gone this far, but repent. God has never backed up and said, I need to change that which I've written unto you because I'm afraid I'm calling you to a lifestyle that's unreachable. God's desire for his church has always been clear. We will see this morning that while Pergamos had died for their faith, while some had been persecuted for their faith, the Lord sends them a letter. While many have been men, while many have persevered, they still have compromised in other areas. Uh, there's many of us today, you know, we all struggle right now. I was talking to a brother last night who is being exhausted with allergies. He was just telling me about how his allergies are wearing him out. He's gone to the doctors. The doctors are giving him medicine. The doctors are giving him a mask. And really what it is to say that, that all of these medicines and all of these masks and all of these allergies, you know, they're, they're really just making his life miserable. But the only true remedy, the ultimate remedy to removing this problem of allergies in this man's life is that he has to get to a place where the air is not saturated with pollen. In Pergamos, not everyone is in sin. Yet, there are some that's in sin. Yet, it is an affecting the entire body. Nevertheless, the church is contaminated. Judgment has fallen Upon the house of God, we know this is familiar to us. Peter says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? There was filth inside the church. The pollen compromised the air, took down the person with allergies. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And now the entire church of Pergamos is standing in judgment. Because why? Because of compromise. Because they were afraid to stand up. See, it is troubling at times even with us that we get so busy fighting and warring against spiritual wickedness in the world that when we arrive at the house of God that we find ourselves accepting things that we should not accept. That's what happened here. I mean, they were warring. They withstood. We'll see even in the next verse. These people were standing up for the Lord. Yet when it came to the house of God, they were so spiritually exhausted from laboring in this world that it seemed that they had given up in the house of God. To kind of give you a background of this church of Pergamos here, it is about 50 miles north of Smyrna. What makes it even worse here is this was considered the religious epicenter of Asia Minor. It sat on a thousand foot high coned hill. It was originally built as a treasury. Matter of fact, the word Pergamos stands for the word citadel, which means this place was a mighty fortress. They believed it to be an impenetrable place. It is one of the most well-excavated places in Turkey today, and it brings great amazement. They had a, a home stadium there that could house over 10,000 people. They had a library there that ha housed over 200,000 volumes of books, all handwritten. They were popular, but they were not popular for the right reason. Notice how the Lord first addresses this church. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 
Imagine this opening being written, written to us today. Imagine that we are the third church that has arrived here in the book of Revelation. We've already seen how the Lord has opened the, this letter to the other churches. We've seen how he said to the church at Ephesus, unto the church of Ephesus, right? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. That is comforting. The one who holds it all in his hands is writing unto you. And by the way, it is comforting, even though the Lord would rightly or even rebuke Ephesus that they left their first love, they are still one of the churches in his hand. When you see when he wrote to the church of Smyrna, he said, and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. That's also comforting that Christ is alive. But when you arrive here at the church of Pergamos, it's not very comforting that he writes unto them, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, he saith he which hath the sharp, with sharp sword with two edges. You see the change of pace here. That now he's writing this letter. One is saying that I'm alive, I'm here with you. One is saying, I'm here, I'm still holding you. Now he's saying, I'm here and I have a sword. Well, this is a change. If this was the, if we was the church, the third church here, 4600 North Edgewood, and the letter opened up that the Lord has come and he was coming here, and while he was in his presence, and we know that his presence is a purifying presence, and he was to write to us here at the church and saying that I am coming unto you, and I am coming with a two-edged sword, we would think to ourselves, why does he need that? It's not much comfort there. It wouldn't be reassuring to us, but here the Lord is saying to them that he has the word of God, that he is the word of God, and the word of God is upon his lips. And for us to really understand, we've already said that this is the religious epicenter, and the only way that you can cut away from this pagan culture is through the word of God. In chapter 1 and verse 16, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. This word not only encourages, it not only lifts up, but it has the power in a precise way as a surgeon uses his scalpel. So the Lord wields his truth in delivering these people out of a pagan culture. The desire is through the use of this word that he will remove his people from this sin of being compromised. Verse 13 I know thy works, where and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Notice here these commendations. As always, he starts, I know thy works. I take this next person to say that this is a commendation, truthfully. When he says, I know thy works, I know your works, and I know how hard those works are because he tells them in this verse, you dwell where Satan's seat is. You dwell where Satan's lies have been prevailing. You're do what you're your works are prevailing where false hope is being handed out. Your, uh, your works are prevailing where people are being deceived. And as we said, this is the religious epicenter. To really understand when he said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, you really need to understand what Pergamos was all about. To understand Pergamos, then when I say that this is the religious epicenter, this will kind of bring your eyes into a light why the Lord is saying this is where Satan's seat is. In Pergamos, there was an altar to Zeus that you could arrive at, and many did, and worshipped Zeus. 
Zeus was known as the god of gods. He was the god of the sky. He was the god in which lightning came from. If you wanted to know someone who could wield ultimate power, you would go to the temple of Zeus and worship him. If you wanted to have a good time, if you wanted to enjoy a life of ecstasy, if you wanted to enjoy a, a life of drinking and partying and sexual immorality, you could easily go to the temple of Dionysus, and there you could worship and participate in many foul acts, and there as you worship this false god. Oh, don't worry, you don't want to do any of those. You could simply slide over to the temple of Athena. And there, Fino, she was the, the goddess of wisdom and the goddess of war. If you had any questions about battle, if you had any questions about wisdom, you could simply go over there and ask them, and there you could get enlightenment from Athena. If you really wanted to understand who was the god of the sea and who was the god of the land, you would go over there and you could go to the temple and wish you could worship Caesar. This was the first person around 29 BC. Pergamus was the first person People that entered into Caesar worship. You can arrive there in this temple, and by the way, these are no small temples. You can arrive at this temple and see Caesar there carved down into a statue with a picture of him with his foot on top of the world saying that he is the Lord of Lords and that he is the King of Kings and that he ruled this land. And don't worry, if you didn't want to stop there and worship Caesar, you could go over to Demetor. The Demeter was another god there. She was the goddess who provided you healthy crops. If you was worried about having food on your table, this is where you went to worship. You would beg her to bring you healthy crops. You would beg her to bring food upon your table. And lastly, if that wasn't as bad as it could get, there was another false deity there known as Escalapius. This was the God in which uh, people would come and worship from all of Asia Minor. They would arrive here to worship Escalapius. Now, we understand this even today because if you was to arrive at Escalapius' temple, you would not find this statue, this carving of a person. You would find the carving of a snake sitting upon a pole. Escalapius is who you would come to to seek healing, to find health. There, even inside the temple, many would come and they would be um, subjected to different drugs and different things and they would enter into this transic state in which snakes would be poured out upon them, non-venomous snakes would be poured out upon them and they believed if the snakes crawled across them, then Escalapius may pass down healing power upon you. And though that may sound crazy to us today, if you look at any ambulance or medical today, you still see that same pole with a snake wrapped around it. This is where this stuff came from. This was the epicenter of Satan's seat. There is no Escalapius. There is no Athena. There, no, there is no Dionysus. There is no Caesar is Lord. There is only Satan. And those instruments that he uses to draw people's eyes away from God. He tells them, I know thy works, and I know how hard it is to work because you dwell where Satan's seat is. I mean, opposition was literally on every side. One man, one commentator said it would be easier to preach the word of God in an ISIS camp than exist here. This is how much hatred is for the word of God and the people of God. Be reminded how we even got this letter. Paul, I mean John, who was on the island of Patmos, for what? Because he preached the word of truth. I say all of this so that we do not quickly pass over that sentence where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. This is where the church was in the midst of all of these temples who propagated lies by Satan himself. This is where Satan sat upon his throne of lies in which he tries to deceive. Realize this, that every one of these temples are a direct attack against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
everything in which they stood for was a direct uh, attack against our Lord, right? I mean, think about this. If you want to be healed, Pergamus would say, go see Escalapius, because then you will be healed. But who does the Bible say the great physician is? It's the Lord. He is the great physician. If you needed wisdom, Pergamus would say, it's no big deal. You can find wisdom here. Or go over to Athena and ask Athena if she will give you wisdom. But what did we learn in the book of James? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally. We go over to the temple. We want to know who is Lord of the sky. Who is the God of all the universe? Who is in control of it all? They would say, please go on over here and see Caesar. He rules the land and sea. If you really want to know who's all powerful, if you want to know who's mighty, if you want to know who can cast out lightning from the sky, go see Zeus. What does the word of God say who's in sovereignly in control of this universe? It's our Lord. It is all attack against our Lord. Even when they would say, well, what harm could it be if you would go and see Demeter and pray unto Demeter and ask Demeter, oh, please, Demeter, can we have a wonderful crop this year? Can you please supply food upon our table? What did our Lord even say here? Matter of fact, even in the end of the text, he says, if you'll just persevere, I will give you hidden manna, which man, no man knowest about. The Lord said, if you trust me, if you follow me, I will provide you the hidden manna. What do we see from our Lord? Listen, know this. Demetor never provided one meal for one person. It is wood, hay, and stubble. But what does our Bible say? That our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with five loaves and two fishes fed how many? That's right. That's what our Lord did. This is the seat in which Satan dwelled. This is the place in which Satan set upon his lies. This is a place where deception seemed to rule the land. It was the epicenter of religion. It was the epicenter of sin. And yet there is an encouragement here. There was a group of people who were not willing to recant. Now, this is the beautiful side of this. How did they ever find out that Antipas was a man of God. Because I believe Antipas was sharing the word of God. How did they ever find out that these people were Christians? Because they were boldly preaching and professing God's word. Now we see this tragic here when it says that, that, that thou, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even those Days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. Now, tradition says that Antipas was the pastor of Pergamus. Many, many authors write and say that this was his position. But one thing that is recorded of certainty, that Antipas was put to death by being boiled to death in a brass bowl for the cause of Christ. What a faithful man unto the end. He knew where they dwelled. That stu sentence stuck with me. He knew exactly where they dwelled. Yet we so liberally offer up our own excuses. How many times have we said we heard, well, you don't understand what it's like for me to come to the house of God because my spouse wants me at home and he doesn't know the Lord. How many times have we said, well, you don't understand what it's like at my job. Therefore, I cannot offer up the truths of God's word. And yet the Lord says, I know the exact situation in which you dwell. And yet, what does he still call for? He still calls for holier living. He still calls for his name to be exalted. He still calls for his name to be lifted up. He still calls for people to wholeheartedly follow after him. I know exactly where you are. I know the things that you've paid. I know the persecution that you've experienced. Nevertheless, it's no excuse for compromise. It's no excuse for sin. You see, this thing that the Lord has against them is because they compromised. You see, if you were in Pergamus in this time, and you would just be willing to go offer up a little incense to Caesar, then leave your church alone. 
And this is even the pressure that we receive from the world today. They don't mind that you say that Jesus is the way to heaven. What bothers them is when they say, when we say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And it is still the same thing for Pergamos in their time. They didn't care that you preached Jesus. They didn't care that you preached Christ and him crucified. But when you preached him as the only solution and the only answer to heaven, it was to bring down all of the judgment from the entire city upon you. Because when you said Christ is the only way, that's exactly what it meant. And yet, this is exactly where we see today. We see even these tele-evangelists who get on these, um, whatever you want to call it. Oprah was the one I'm thinking of. I don't mind to give it to you because she did it. But Oprah asked him, this preacher, do you really believe that Jesus is the only way? His tongue was sticking to his mouth because he didn't know what to say. And he would eventually cave and say, well, Jesus is the only way for me. But I believe there's many other ways for other people. Nonsense. He caved to the pressure. He would have fit in Pergamos. May we never fit in Pergamos. He is the only way. I know where you dwell. I know the home life you have. I know about your spouse. I know about your co-workers, and yet I still call for you to be holy. In the midst of all this, they were, no, that's what it says. In the midst of all of this, there were people who were holding fast to the Lord's name. In the midst of all of this, there were people who had not denied the faith. Even when their faithful friend was murdered, they did not waver. These were Gentile people born and raised in a pagan culture. God had delivered them out of this pagan culture. Could you imagine if someone was to come in here today and take one of us out of here and take them out to the lot and burn them in a brass bowl? I would be troubled to think how many people would be excited about coming back this evening. Who would be excited about even if they was to say, if you don't recant, you're next in the bowl. Yet these people did not waver. They withstood it. They stood fast. They withstood the opposition from the outside looking in. But here we see in verse 14, they had become a faltering church. While they did good, withstanding the world, where they failed to act, was inside the house of God. This is one of the clearest things that was brought to my mind. Why it is so important. I know we step back and we say, listen, I don't like church discipline. I don't like an act and discipline upon people in the church. Yet in the same breath, we say when we know somebody who is a member in the house of God and who's out wickedly living in sin, what we're saying is make us like Pergamos, Lord. Judge us all because we refuse to do this work. The alternative was this. You handle it or I will. This is what the Lord offered up to Pergamus about this sin. He said, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, idols and to commit fornication. They stood fast, but it would not be for long. The same lifestyle this they were saved from. There were people in the house of God drawing them back into this same sin. He says to them that the Lord was angry with them because there were people within the church who held to the doctrine of Balaam. It is a great text. You can read it in your own time in the book of Numbers about this sorcerer, Balak, who was hired by the king of, uh, excuse me, Balaam was the sorcerer. Balak was the king of Moab. He was hired to buy, Balaam was hired by Balak to cast upon the children of Israel a curse. And after four times failing, at the curse. Every time he went to go and give them this curse, God re refused Balaam the opportunity to do it. And a matter of fact, the last time 
which really could be a sermon for another time. The last time Balaam went to go put the curse upon the people of Israel, he was riding on the donkey, and the angel of the Lord with the sword in his hand prepared before Balaam, and, when, and the, the donkey stopped, and Balaam was so angry with the donkey that the donkey see the angel of the Lord with the sword, that the donkey spoke unto him, warning that you don't want to go this way. He totally put to the side that the donkey even spoke and became so angry with the donkey that he was ready to kill it. You know, it brings us to our own minds why we get so mad at the donkey, so to say. Why we get so mad about when people say God's word says this, and we become angry with the people who give us truth. Why are we so mad? Why are we so mad? We should be mad that we are behaving in a way that is against God. God said, I am angry that you have allowed people in the church who teach this doctrine of Baal. So when Baal couldn't put a curse upon the people of Israel, you know what he did? He went over to Moab. He did a play. He said, I cannot overpower God, but I can tell you what to do because the God of Israel is a righteous God. The God of Israel is a holy God. The God of Israel is a just God. And if you can convince the people of Israel, the men of Israel, to fall into sin with your people, their God is so righteous, so holy, so just, that he will bring judgment upon them. And then, then, Balak, you can have your way. The Lord is angry with the people in Pergamos because they have allowed people in the house of God to say, hey, you know what? Christ is still the way. But look, we don't have to die if we go over here and burn incense to Caesar. Listen, we don't have to die if we go over here to Dionysus and involve ourselves according to verse 14 in the end to eat the things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Listen, we don't have to persecute. We're going to trick them. We're going to be Christians, but we're going to involve ourselves with other things so that we can remain in safety. Now, we understand what Paul says about eating meat that was offered up to idols. He said, that's not the offering. It doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't hurt me or it doesn't help me. But when you go to the temple of Dionysus and eat the meat that's being sacrificed, it is a part of the worship there. They had involved themselves in the worship in Pergamos, all for the sake of safety. The Lord was angry because the hearts of the people were being divided. He told them, love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy strength. This was since the beginning of time. This is since Deuteronomy. How long can you halt between two opinions? Hey, how long will you choose between God and mammon? There has never been an ability to serve both. It doesn't exist. First John says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. Even more, we see here that they... Of the so thou hast thou so thou in verse 15 so thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate to give you the exact answer of what was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans I cannot do but it is a safe thing to say that which things God hates he hates he has not changed. He didn't like the doctrine of the Nicolaitans then, and he does not like the doctrine of the Nicolaitans now. They were so afraid of the outside judgment that they had become participators. The participators came into the house of God smelling like the incense of a strange God. They were pulling others in. And so the Lord says, deal with them. Repent or else, or else what? I will come unto thee quickly, and I and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. While the church at Ephesus did everything they did, did, did everything they could to preserve the truths and the doctrines of God's word. They did everything they could. They tried them which said they were apostles, and when they failed the doctrine test, they were casted out. 
it would appear that the church of Pergamos had no such test. Mm, they had brought the, not only brought the sinner in, but they accepted the sin of the sinner. The call for all of this sin is for them to repent. But the Lord says here, something wonderful to the overcomer. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. There is two things to know about these white stones. White stones were given to people on two different occasions. If you were to participate in the Olympic Games and you was to receive a medal, if you was to win, if you was to qualify, and you was the one to be lifted up, you was, giving a, you was given a white stone. There's also another thought process on this white stone. If the king in the land was to ever show a special celebration, if he was to ever have a special event into which you were specifically invited, uh, the soldiers would arrive in your home and present you with a white stone that had your name engraved in it. And when you would arrive at this grand celebration at the gate, you would present the person who held the gate with the white stone, and that would gain your access. When the Lord says here that to him that overcometh will be given him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. While there's lots and lots of definitions and lots and lots of things that people believe about this, this is the important takeaway from this. It is that we will receive in our hands if we will overcome, if we will overcome the opposition in the land. We will receive something special in our hand from the Lord that will give us access that we could not have without it. It is something so special that when it is given to us, it says that he, no man knoweth it, what it says, save the man who receives it. The challenge to the church at Pergamos is not to compromise. The challenge to the church at Pergamos is to get back to the truth. While you have done well, while you have labored hard, while you have not compromised, while you have stood the face, withstood the face of the enemy, while you have, many of you have been put to death, while even under the pressures you have not denied my name. This is great. I'm thankful for that. You have not denied my name, but in the same breath, you've compromised by saying that these other gods are away too. That's unacceptable. The challenge to the church at Pergamos is this. I will not let you corrupt my house. I will not let you corrupt the house of God. You have but two options. The church can function as it's supposed to function and handle the sin that's in the camp, or I will come and handle it myself. You see, there's no option. The Lord doesn't say here, or I'll depart from you. He doesn't say, or I'll remove my candlestick. No, that's not what the Lord says. The Lord says, I'll remove you. I'm not the problem. You are. This is the challenge to the church of Pergamos. This is the challenge even to our own lives to recognize and to fully understand that our sin, just like a little pollen in the air, can affect our entire body. Now, the entire air that we're breathing in isn't all bad, right? It has oxygen in it in which we desperately need. But the pollen... The pollen has enough, if there's enough pollen in the air, it will make us miserable into the place where we'll call off work because we can't even function. And so the Lord says to Pergamos, there's enough sin in your camp that this church is not going to function properly unless it be purified. There's good news. The church can purify its presence, but I can also purify my presence myself. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you for all that you've done, Lord.
We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for our studies through uh, this portion of Revelations, Lord. I pray that we'll continue to glean from it, Lord. May we be, even in our own lives, uh, a group of people who don't ever falter in our walk. Lord, may we be a group of people that when we slip, when we find ourselves in a situation, when we find ourselves in the mud, when we find ourselves in a mistake, may we never forget that one day our ticket is going to be out of here. And that this is not the place for us to stay. That there is a call upon our lives. And that there is a purpose in which we need to do. And that may we never be satisfied in sin. Lord, we pray carefully, but with the hand of mercy and loving kindness, Lord. That if sin hinders the church, then our prayer is, Lord, that you make our sin before our eyes, Lord. And Lord, if our hearts refuse to get our sin right, then we pray that you do your work. Because our desire is, Lord, at the Flynn Place Baptist Church, 4600 North Edgewood, that we come here every week to meet with you. And Lord, if there be anything that hinder your spirit, Lord, it should be all of our desires that you remove it, no matter what it may be. We say that carefully and prayerfully, Lord, not in not in a, a foolish threat, but an understanding of your promises and how you conduct yourself in your churches. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.